Hello, and welcome to Season 12 of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. Each week we watch the same movie on our own and then hop on a call to discuss it. This season, the theme is blatant pandering. We're going to review 10 movies that were either made in or set in the U.S. states that have downloaded the most episodes of The Horrific over the last few years. This will be a shorter season, so we may work in some listener recommendations and horror news along the way, too. Thanks for listening. So as we continue through our pandering season, where we attempt to, I guess, appeal to the places that already download our episodes the most by doing reviews of movies that are either set in or filmed in those locations. We find ourselves taking a little trip to Washington, D.C. this week. Yes, sir. And a little trip back in time Uh to the year 1959 to discuss the movie called Earth vs. the Flying Saucers. Oh, yeah. This is one that I have heard referenced. I thought I had maybe seen it in the past, but I definitely hadn't. And everything about this movie made me think that it's the type of horror movie that would be on a TV in the background of another horror movie. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it has been. <laughs> it had but, to. It, but it was just kind of that like campy 50s sci-fi horror, you know? Yeah. And I feel like in any movie that came out now about, you know, aliens or flying saucers or whatever. Like this is the type of movie that would be uh, on a screen that the kids were watching in the background or something. Mm-hmm. It's just so like on point for that. But yeah, this is the first kind of sci-fi horror one that we've done in a while. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, I don't know this for sure, but just since the hundred years of horror season. Yeah. And I know that typically that's not exactly your favorite so I will be curious to hear more about what you thought of this one. But Well, like sci-fi's horror are, but those are like newer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, older ones. Just they get grandfathered in. Save it for the main discussion. Oh, I know, but I don't have any drama about it. Well, they didn't know that till now. Oh. <sighs> Damn it. Okay. Let me get this back on track. I'm going to do the introduction. You can do your fun facts, and then we will get into the disintegration ray details. Love it. Also, apparently I just said that was in 1959. It was actually 1956. But in 1956, Columbia Pictures brought us Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, a science fiction horror film directed by Fred F. Sears and based on a best-selling novel called Flying Saucers from Outer Space. This movie tells the story of Earth's first encounter with aliens from outer space. It doesn't go well. Not Mars tax bad, but still pretty rough. Thankfully, though, Earth has Dr. Randall Marvin, who might just be the wild card thinker we need to survive this mess. Couldn't find any budget or box office numbers for Earth vs. the Flying Saucers that didn't sound entirely made up, but this movie does have a lasting legacy of being known as the father of Flying Saucer films. It can currently be rented for streaming on Amazon Prime Video. What did you learn about this movie? So I think where we've heard this before was this was the influence of Tim Burton for, uh, with the movie Mars Attack. Mm-hmm. Like this was, I know we've, I had to have talked about that with, uh, during that, that episode, yeah. I guess I should say. Um, it was also released as a double feature with, uh, the wolf man, which I think is, or oh, I'm sorry, with the were, the werewolf. Okay. Uh, which I think is just pretty cool, too. Yeah. 1956, The Werewolf. Um, a lot of the footage that you see in this is actually, like, of the flying and the destruction in the skies is uh, actual stock footage. So, like, the satellite launch, that was stock footage of uh, some rockets. When one of the destroyers was blown, blown up, that was stock footage of... Uh, uh, an actual like testing that they were doing and shot that down. Um, and then the last one, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the last actual fact that I have for this is, uh, the narrator of this also was the narrator for, uh, the haunted mansion rides at Disneyland. 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and uh, he also did a bunch of voices uh, for Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Nice. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. Which came out in 1959, for the record. You sure it wasn't 1956? Hey, you, you never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you talked about the narrator. That was one thing that I, I feel like a lot of this movie was meant to have like an old timey news report vibe. And so it didn't like come out and say based on a true story or anything in the beginning. But I think the way that it was presented at certain points almost made it feel like the presentation was the same as like a news update that they would show in between movies or before movies at movie theaters back around that time. And so I think it would have created like a feeling in the audience of this has some legitimacy or like this could be real. Like, I think it was kind of going for that same vibe in the beginning, but in a, just a little bit different way, like really similar to when we talked about the town that dreaded sundown where it, it kind of had that like narration and almost like documentary news report style um, to give it a little bit more of a, a feeling of authenticity. Yeah. I actually have almost that exact thing like in my notes to start off with where nice. like they, it definitely, they didn't come out and say it was, it was uh based on a true story, but 1000% like felt like it. Yeah. Without yeah. a doubt. Like I absolutely thought that was the case. Yeah. Or why they, why they added it. Yeah. And I think that it was fairly effective. Um, Oh, one thing I did want to ask, though, I I rented the colorized version. Did you watch it in color or black and white? I did color, yeah. So I did, too. And there there are some places where I almost wish I hadn't. Same. Because it would have been really interesting to see, like, especially with, like, the laser beams and stuff. Like, how – I don't really know what that would have even looked like if there weren't color to, like, distinguish it. Yeah. I actually um, – like, so I I watched it maybe halfway through and thought to myself like, Oh shoot, you probably should have done the black and white based yeah. off of, yeah, just like, and it also was just a little off on the color, color side. Oh so. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, like that grass looked, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, that, that was just kind of an interesting thing. And I, I don't really know why I did the colorized version other than I think it was the first option when I was looking at uh, rentals. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that especially so even like, like thinking about like seeing it being presented more as like that new style. If it were in black and white, I feel like you can get away with a lot more. Like things don't look as obviously fake a lot of times when they're in black and white as they do in color. Um, but then the other side of that is all the stuff like the, the laser beams and the force fields and stuff, I think would have also been a lot harder to like differentiate or like tell what was going on. So mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was definitely like a little catch point too, but there were, 100% times watching this for the first time in color and, and realizing like just what by watching, like, yep, should have been black and white. Like, yeah. That would have been, <laughs> that would have been a lot better. I don't know if it's from our history of watching the Twilight Zone series mm-hmm. like a billion times or yeah. what, but like, yeah, you just kind of know like, yep, this was made for black and white. It should probably stayed that way. Yeah. Yeah. So story wise, was, I guess the general setup was that, you know, Earth had detected that there were these, you know, UFOs or flying saucers in space. They had been sending these like monitoring stations up and they had been falling back down sort of unexplainedly. And then all of a sudden you have these UFOs that are showing up and they're trying to communicate, but people, their army reacts by like attacking and then things escalate. And then, uh, they're basically saying that Earth needs to surrender, and you know, obviously Earth doesn't want to do that. And so then they just start <laughs> spend like half the movie of just kind of like low budget special effect flying saucers uh, around major like world landmarks. And there's Dr. Marvin who develops some kind of like sound wave gun that can can attack them. So once the earthlings have those, then they can sort of like shoot the, the saucers and then they kind of spin out of control and crash into major, uh, world landmarks. So it really seemed like the thing they were kind of leaning into with this was like, here's like the Eiffel Tower and here's a flying saucer. And now it's either going to shoot it or fly into it. And, 
they're like, cool, that, that can easily fill up 45 minutes of movie time. Yeah. <laughs> so the, so it did get a little, um, repetitive, I guess, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely did. And you know, you just kind of think while watching it too, like, is this only happening because it's, uh, or, you know, like with those scenes, like with the Eiffel Tower and all that, it's like, well, okay, how you have a narrator that could just say like, it's happening in Paris, it's happening in Rome, you know, whatever the case, like you don't have to show it. Yeah. <laughs> it right. could definitely save, save a little bit of hassle, but, um, granted they were, they did what they did, I guess, yeah. you know. Well, and I kind of wondered too, if maybe there was, so this is like post World War II when a lot of people have been seeing news reports from other parts of the world pretty regularly for a while. Whereas I don't know that that would have happened before, like in video, I mean. So I, I don't know that that would have happened before that time. Mm. So maybe there was something about this where it was like tapped into, you know, even more of like people are used to seeing these news updates from like different locations in other parts of the world. And so showing that this was happening like in all those places or something might have played well into like current, like that believability factor almost. Yeah. But I don't know. It, it it just, I feel like on paper, this movie is a hundred percent like in my bag, like what I'm excited to see. Mm-hmm. And I just was kind of bored for a lot of it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was, I definitely had, had the similar, you know, feeling to it. Um, being that we were around the Halloween season, it's, uh, I think initially it was like, yeah, I want to add this on there. Just be nice to have an old school, you know, sci-fi film to, to throw on there. Um, and then while watching, I was like, oh yeah, maybe should have done a little bit, a little bit more research because it did just get kind of boring, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, we get it. We get it. Like, let's yeah. see some action. Let's see. Let's see it go down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and the, you know, I'm, I'm sure they were limited on, you know, what you could do technologically from a, a special effects perspective. Um, and I think but, it could have also been like, like the whole, um, night of the living dead. Um, like you've talked about before where, uh, it's a lot about the inner ter- turmoil that's going on mm-hmm, too, sure. you know, yeah. and that could have been what they were trying to get across. But, um, you know, for, for me, I was just wanting to see like old school sci-fi yeah. film and, you know, uh, what was the last one? Ants was that what it was called or something oh, like them. that? Them. Yeah. With the, with the ants. Um, it was like, that's, that's, that's what I was like looking forward to. And yeah. Well, and the, yeah, and we, we talked about with Terrifier how almost being like more limited on your locations can be really effective with horror. Whereas with this one, you spent so much time like halfway across the world watching the chaos and stuff. You didn't really, or at least I didn't feel any like super strong connection to any of the characters outside of Dr. Marvin, who was really just kind of like in control of helping Earth fight back. Like he, he didn't feel like particularly like super in danger for a lot of the movie. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I, I do think that, that as far as just kind of the overall story arc, this was a pretty influential movie as far as setting up what would become like the alien invasion genre. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think if, if you just kind of take it at the basic level of like, all of a sudden we see these, you know, flying saucers from outer space. And then that causes chaos on the earth. And then we have contact with the aliens and they basically tell us that we need to surrender. And then we have to race against time to try and figure out a way to take them down, even though they're technologically superior and it's doing damage all across the planet and humanity is sort of being united against this common enemy. Like so many movies have copied that, like that, that that alien invasion or alien attack Horror, I think, is a a formula, and this is pretty much, at least in my mind, you know, the the first one that really did that, and it's been copied over and over and over for, you know, over half a century at this point. I mean, yeah, I think you just think of like, like Independence Day, like yeah, any yeah, any sure. yeah. any alien film for the majority of the past, like, I don't know, three decades, four decades. 
for the most part. But yeah, it definitely did the right formula for it. Um, I'm definitely happy it inspired these other yeah. films as well too. You know, it was definitely a, um, I mean, it wasn't bad. It was just at times boring, I guess. I sh- yeah. You know, it's the best way to kind of put it in, in my opinion. And it's one of those things too, where we've talked about this a number of times in that sometimes a movie that does a thing first doesn't hold up when you try to go back to it after a long time, yeah. because you've seen so many other movies like improve upon the original idea with better acting and better special effects and, you know, higher budgets and, and all of that stuff that when you go back and look at the one that it all started from, it's almost like, oh, yeah, this is just boring because I've seen this movie a hundred times and this is not the best version of it. But at the time, you know, being able to see that and the same thing with music, right? Like you go back and listen to some of the early like pop punk albums and it's just like, this is dumb. But at the time that they came out, like that was a new and exciting thing that people hadn't heard that hadn't been copied a million times. And so it's really hard to kind of when you weren't there for the beginning of something to like revisit the beginning and have the same, have it have the same impact that it would have had if you were there. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair to say. It's absolutely correct too. But I, I, yeah, I mean, a lot of things about this were cool ideas. I think I would actually be more interested in reading the book than ever watching the movie again, but all this stuff about them, like uploading the brains and the sort of figuring out the communication between the aliens and the humans and stuff like there were some cool, like just straight sci-fi ideas there, which is a thing I really enjoy. Um, but again, the, the kind of the pace and tone of the movie, it was not super long, but it felt super long. Yeah. I almost felt betrayed watching it. <laughs> like when I was, when I was going, when I was going through it, I was like, but you promised, you promised it was going to be short. <laughs> I took that personally. <laughs> yeah. It definitely doesn't. It just didn't feel feel that way, but yeah. 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 So anyway, probably won't revisit this one. Um and I also the ending. I think one of the things that really got me about it was the ending. And, and it definitely was more like in the vein of some of the older horror movies that we've watched. Yeah. Where it's just like Okay, everything builds up, and then all of a sudden the bad guy's defeated, and uh, the hero and his love interest are now living happily ever after. Yeah, and it's just like, oh wow, that was quick. I guess we're not going to deal with you know the aftermath of any of this, or you know, what it means for humanity, or the Earth, or yeah. how we're rebuilding, or anything else. Like, no, nope, just a homeboy and his woman on a beach uh, talking about how wonderful the planet is. Yeah, and <laughs> let's just go for a swim. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just like oh, the world is is perfect again. And it's like oh, okay, no, that mm-hmm. definitely definitely not, you know. But yeah, um, so so anyway, definitely more of a I would say Hollywood ending than horror ending. But yeah, which you have what, to expect. What when, can you do? Yeah. Especially when it's you know Earth first flying saucers, but you know like the the main uh, battle is revolved around you know Washington D.C. Yeah. Which is a great place uh, that has a uh, good taste in podcast. You dang right. Have you ever been to D- DC? Oh no, huh. I haven't either. I feel like uh, we're in the area of the country where that's not like a field trip destination. Right. It's just far enough away. Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. But I'd like to go someday. Yeah, I got warrants. And that's it for today's episode. If you've listened this far, then thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed it. We're always looking for new ideas, so if you have any questions, comments, or movie suggestions, please send us an email at thehorrificpod at gmail.com, or feel free to comment on or message our Facebook page. Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening.